Hi, this is Hank, the timer guy, or better known as the owner of Texas Timers. And what I've prepared to show you is sort of a tutorial on the components used in electric flight. I'll try to really focus on E36, uh, but the parts are the same, they're just bigger in size or smaller in size. Uh, and why am I doing this? Well, how does it relate to Texas Timers? Well, it really doesn't. Uh, but one of the leading kit manufacturers uh, had asked me to try to put together something that would give a, a total newcomer an overview of, of electric fight and what, the parts that are need, used in it and what you might have to do after you buy the parts as far as modifying things and so forth before you're actually ready to use them. So that's what we're going to try to do. It's going to be in three phases. First phase is just going to talk about each part individually and, and, and what to look for when you're buying them. The next part is going to show how to connect all these items together and, and it's going to be the same regardless of whether you're flying E36 or one of the other electric events. All the parts are the same uh, as far as the, generically. Uh, and then the final thing is going to be I'm going to show you everything put together and running in, a, in an airplane. Uh, so that you can see uh, how, the, how everything plays together uh, and, and works. So thank you. From there, let's get started. Well, let's start first of all with the motor of the propeller, the very front of the airplane. Uh, obviously the propeller is the first, but before, we, before I jump to the propeller, let's just take a look at some typical motors that are used in, like in E36. Uh, this is a very basic motor that's used in E36, and this is a, 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 a typical mount that's used, used with that. You'll see this slides right over the stem of that motor, and then there are two grub screws here and, oops, and here uh, that you tighten up, and then you've got three screw holes to mount it to your firewall. Uh, all of these are called brushless motors. Okay, You may have heard the term, but you don't know what it is. Well, the old traditional electric motor had actual carbon brushes in there that made co contact with what was called the commutators. Today we have none of that. There's no brushes in here, no carbon, no carbon uh, plates. Uh, on these brushless motors, the case rotates. This, the, you see this. I mean, it's kind of hard to see, perhaps, in the picture, but this is where the propeller is, and that whole case is rotating, whereas this remains stationary. And so that's that's not the definition of a brushless motor, but that's how you can tell a brushless motor from a brush motor. Why brushless? Because they're far more efficient, they're lighter weight, and there's just no question that if you're going to be flying free fright, even in sport, uh, you want to use a brushless motor uh, because they're just so infinitely better. All right. Here's another typical brushless motor. This one is considerably more powerful, and yes, it weighs more. So if you need a little extra weight in the nose, that's a good choice. But if you need more power, this is an excellent motor. This one, this one is I sell. It's called the Texas Red, Red Max. Now, how do we connect the, the motor to the propeller? There's basically two ways to do that. Most people are using a folding propeller. And this is a typical folder made by the Grotner Company in Germany. And this is the hub that's used with the folder. So these are the blades. When you buy a set of propellers, it comes with, with two blades, and, and the hub you have to buy separately. The hub fits over the shaft. Now, you'll notice there's a lot of space, because this, this is for a different motor. Uh, but once again, two grub screws, one on each side. You tighten it up, and then the, 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 this hub is firm, permanently attached, or, or not permanently, but f securely fixed to the motor shaft. The motor shaft, by the way, is typically three millimeters in most of the motors that we use for free flight. Not all of them, so you have to watch that, but typically three millimeter motor shaft. And, and this is a hub that's for use uh, basically with the three millimeter motor shaft and the two grub screws to tighten it down. And then when, that, when this motor stops, what happens is these propeller blades fold back immediately because the plane is going through the air and it causes these blades, which are very loose in the hinge, uh, to fold back. And therefore you have a much, much reduced drag. So a, a, a folder is sort of prefer, preferred uh, in free flight because of the reduced drag. However, there are people that still prefer to use a fixed bladed prop. Now, if you're using a fixed bladed prop, there's another solution to how you attach that propeller to the motor. Uh, 
Uh, and this is called a, a prop saver. Once again, this slides over the motor shaft. Well, I've got to loosen these screws up a little bit here. Anyway, it slides over the motor shaft, and then the propeller blade sits on top of this little cone, and then it uses uh, little rubber bands, actually O-rings. Where? <laughs> well, there's an O-ring uh, that's used to attach that propeller blade to this motor cone. Just think about it being just kind of like, like this here, okay? And then you stretch stretch a, this rubber band or the O-ring between these two screw, head, two screw shafts. And that will attach the, the propeller to the motor shaft. Either one gives you some protection for the motor because if you didn't have something that was flexible like this rubber band or like the folder, uh, if you happen to hit the ground with the nose front, you could bend or break the motor shaft. And when you do that, you're really kind of in a whole lot of hurt. So we use the folder props or this thing called the prop saver with, with the O-ring connection uh, to protect the motor shaft uh, from damage. And also it, it helps also to protect the propeller from damage. Uh, here is, the, is a propeller hub. Uh, folding hub attached to uh, one of these typical motors and you'll notice that the motor is, as I turn this you can see that motor uh, the case is turning that's again is a, is a brushless motor okay all right so now we've talked about the propeller and by the way propellers they come in different sizes just like in anything in free flight sometimes the propellers have a larger diameter a smaller diameter, greater pitch, lesser pitch. Something the motors, one motor likes a propeller better than another, than it does a different propeller. Uh, a very, very ordinary thing, or very common thing that you find, however, in the specification of these motors is, this, is a number called KV. And KV is extremely important because that is the number of revolutions per minute that the motor will make with no propeller attached using a given battery voltage, whether that be two cells, which would be 8.4 volts, or three cells, 11.1 uh, .1 volts. Uh, it, it, it tells you what the motor's ability is to, 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 to spin something at what speed. And uh, we use that in conjunction with the, the diameter and the pitch uh, to adjust our thrust line, or adjust the thrust uh, for our airplanes. Once again, uh, I'm not going to try to give you any hard answers here uh, because it, it, there's a big variation uh, in, in uh, what the motors are out in the marketplace. It's a constantly changing thing. Every year, every year or every, almost every month, a new motor shows up and it becomes the motor of the month and everybody rushes off to buy it. So anyway, uh, ask somebody, if you don't know, either ask your kit supplier what, what motor he's recommending for use with his airplane. Uh, or ask one of your flying buddies. Uh, go out to a flying field and ask them what they're finding, what the, what motor they're finding is works best with what. All right. Now that we've talked about the propeller and the motor, let's go on to something else. One other thing that I for forgot to mention to you when, before uh, was that every motor you buy is going to not is not going to come with any connectors. They all just have bare wires. So it's going to be up to you to attach connectors, suitable connectors, to that motor to, to match the rest of their parts in your airplane. Uh, here, in this particular motor, uh, you'll notice I have three connectors. Uh, these, are, these are called banana pin or bullet connectors, just basically because of, their, of the shape. And, the, and these are defined by the diameter of the pins. Uh, these happen to be two millimeter, which is by far the most common for E36. Uh, when you start flying with much bigger motors and so forth, then you're going to be using maybe a three millimeter or three and a half millimeter instead of a two millimeter. But these are very commonly used. It's almost a generic pin for the motors. Okay, now let's move on to the battery. This is a very typical battery, both in size as well as capacity uh, for E36. Uh, this uh, is 325 milliampere hours. 
uh, and is, is two cells, which means that it's uh, 8.4 volts. Uh, why is that important? Well, <laughs> to meet the rules of E36 for, for, for one thing, because E36 cannot have more than two cells of a LiPo battery. Why are we using LiPos? LiPo standing for lithium polymer. Why, why are we using LiPos instead of the old trusty uh, nickel, nickel, nickel cadmium or NICADs? Well, because these are so much better, they're lighter weight, and they are just far, far superior uh, to the old uh, battery technology. So everybody uses a LiPo battery. Uh, and uh, they might use one with, with more or less battery capacity than the 325 uh, that I mentioned. Uh, but, but they're still very, very similar. Take a look here. Most batteries come, particularly batteries in this size, will come with what's called a red JST connector. Uh, and although this connector is very suitable for use in radio control, which is, which is by far the largest market for this type of a battery, uh, the, this connector is not at all suitable for free flight. Why? Because the connector has too much internal resistance in it, and it's in it for, for the kind of power or current that we pull in, in free flight. And these connectors tend to get hot, that means that there's resistance in there. That means you're losing power. And if there's anything you don't want to do in free flight, it's lose power. So what do we use instead? This is most too commonly used. People use this connector with the battery for E36. Uh, and this, is, this one is called a Dean's 2-pin micro-polarized connector. Uh, yes, there is fairly touchy soldering work that needs to be done to connect these wires to, to this connector. And then, of course, I have applied shrink tubing uh, over this to protect all the, the bare surfaces so there's no chance of a short. Uh, if you were using these, uh, a larger battery with a larger airplane, like Class A or Class B, or FAF F1Q, for example, uh, you would use a different connector. But these, this connector is more than suitable for E36 and the power that we draw there. I mentioned milliampere hours, and without getting too technical here, uh, that is a sign of how large the battery is because milliampere hours it indicates the total amount of charge that's inside this little package. It doesn't indicate the battery voltage, but it indicates the charge that's in there. Uh, and that what that basically says is that you, if you have a load, like a, <laughs> a motor or a light bulb that draws 325 milliampers or milliamps, that's, that's 325 thousandths of an amp, or just a little less than a third of an amp, for example, uh, it would go for one hour before being dead. That's, that's what all that means. The other very important uh, specification on a battery is the C rating. Now, this says 70C. What does C mean? Well, C is, C is nothing more than a shorthand for 325. So what does the 70 mean? The 70 means that this battery is capable of delivering 70 times 325 milliampers on an instantaneous uh, uh, basis. Now, how much power is that? Well, that's 325. Let me see here if I got it multiplied out. And I can't find it. <laughs> oh, no. That, that is 22.5 uh, amperes. So we went from roughly a third of an amp to 22.5 amperes. Uh, as far as being the total power that, to, that you could draw instantaneously from this battery. Why is that important? Well, that's important because when we start these motors, uh, they're starting from a dead, dead stop, and there is a large inrush of, of current to get that before that motor starts uh, spinning. And you need, uh, uh, the higher the C, the ba basically the better. Also, that indicates that you can swing a bigger prop or a prop with more, more pitch on it, or you can run a larger motor. But the C rating is, is important, as well as the, the, the uh, milliampere hours of that battery. And once again, for E36, we're limited by the rules to a two-cell battery. Uh, each battery on a lithium has 3.7 volts, so as a total, this is 8.4 volts uh, as, a, as a nominal voltage on the battery. 
Oh, how many flights can you get? A lot of people ask that. Well, we're only running the motor for, well, like a maximum of 15 seconds. So, but typically you're only going to be running it for maybe 10 seconds, particularly when you're getting into the, the advanced stages of, of your fly-offs. And yes, you can fly for probably six times on one charge. However, you don't want to do that if you're in competition. If you're in competition, you want to charge the battery on every official flight because that puts this battery up at the maximum capacity uh, for each flight. And if you're up against tough competition, and that's what's out there these days, uh, you want that battery to be as, as fully up to snuff as it can be. But otherwise, you know, yes, you can figure that you can get six flights out of this without recharging it if you really wanted to, particularly if you're out test flight or just having some fun. All right, what's next? Well, something near and dear to my heart, the timer. Uh, this happens to be my product, Texas Timers, and this is the timer. Now, what does the timer do? Uh, basically, it's pretty simple. It shuts the motor off after so many seconds, and it activates what's called the DT, or the DT servo, to uh, bring the airplane back down to the ground at the end of your flight. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail because you know this once it you you might be using a different brand of timer than this one, but this one the, the, this timer has an, a unique features compared to some other timers on the market that there's two rotary switches here, and all the times that you need for every uh, every type of electric flight that's that's has, that's in the rule book has all the motor times set up already pre-programmed into this switch, into, the, into, the, into this device and you merely rotate this little switch with a little screwdriver to a different pointer from 0 to 9. And similarly the DT times, everything from 1.3 seconds after the engine quits which is highly useful when you're doing a test flying, uh, all the way up to, to 3 minutes uh, for an extended F1Q flight. On the back of the timer, we've got two three-pin connectors. The bottom row of connectors is used for the servo, and the top row of connectors is used for the timer. Uh, and, and actually, you don't have to remember it because it's right here on the labeling on, on the back of the board where it says ESC and servo. That tells you which, one's, which one is which, and you're also going to see the minus sign and a plus sign. For purposes of electricity when we're flying with free flight, the black wire is always minus and the red wire is always plus and then the signal wire, the wire that contains the information that you're sending over that cable uh, is usually an orange or white. It can be many different colors but it's definitely not black and it's not red. Uh, what's this funny thing here? Well, this is called the, the RDT pigtail, uh, and we'll, we will be talking about that later on. But this is where, if you're, if you're flying where you might have a constrained flying field, uh, and the airplane possibly could drift over an area where retrieval could be extremely difficult, if not impossible, uh, you might want to early DT the plane and bring it back down safely. All right, uh, now. Uh, something that I should point out on the on the front of, of the timer, which this will be the part that you're looking at or you're seeing on your airplane fuselage. But I said here's the switch for the motor time, the switch for the DT time. Here's a red button. What does this do? Well, the, several things. Uh, you don't want to have your motor, which has a propeller that spins extremely fast and the propeller is sharp, you don't want to have that motor just starting indiscriminately. So this is a switch that first of all will arm the timer. Uh, you push the button once and release and this LED here will start flashing very rapidly. That indicates the timer is armed and is ready to, to start the motor. All right, But the motor still is not running. What we do now is we push the button in and we hold it for about two seconds or until the motor starts. And it's, it's, after two seconds the motor will start running at full speed. And we're still, it's still the timer has not started yet. But when we're ready to launch, we release the button like this, 
and immediately the, this starts this starts flashing rapidly indicating the timer is running and, th and that also means that the motor timer has started and once the motor stops based on the setting here the, the LED stops and then it starts flashing again indicating that it's that it's also running in the DT mode and once, once again when it reaches the preset DT time the LED stops flashing now let's say you're holding your airplane uh, the motor is running and you decide oops I really don't want to fly right now uh, it's the wind has come up or whatever and how do you we, how do we stop everything you stop merely by just tapping this button and that automatically stops the motor and resets the timer back to your starting position. You don't have to make any adjustments uh, in your switches here. That still st the, st the settings stay the same, but it does stop the motor. It's, it's kind of another safety feature, and it's also a feature that says that if you suddenly decide you don't want to fly after you've started the motor, you just tap the button and that stops the motor immediately. I mentioned uh, before about the switches that we have uh, for various times and I would be remiss if I didn't point out some of the very significant differences between the Texas Timers brand of timer and others that you might find out in the marketplace. Uh, as I stated before, you have all the motor and DT times uh, preset on the chip that's inside here, on the microprocessor that you're going to need for any type of electric flight, uh, regardless of what category it is, whether it's AMA, FAI, E36, uh, or even sport flying. Uh, they're all set in, already set in the timer, and there's nothing else you have to buy. Some brands of timers require you to have a chip that you plug in to the board if you want to make changes. No chips are needed with, with my timer. Uh, additionally, other timers might require you to use a computer, yuck, to make changes out of the flying field to your times. What a hassle that is. Also, uh, when you fly uh, with my timer, you don't need to do any resets uh, on, on anything. It's ready to go immediately after each flight uh, unless you want to change one of the times. There's nothing set. Some timers require you to push a button and count how many times you push it and look at a light flashing. And who wants to try to count light flashes uh, out on the flying field in the bright sunlight? Uh, that's just an open invitation for mistakes to happen and errors to occur. So uh, another very, very positive feature uh, of this timer. Okay. All right, let's say that you don't want one of the pre-programmed times that are in here. As I said, all the times that you're going to need for any official flying are already set. But let's say you want something totally off the wall. We have provisions that if you order the timer with a small connector put, placed up here, uh, you are able to come in with a PC and using free software, you can set the motor and DT times for any time you want from zero up to 600 seconds, that's 10 minutes. Uh, that could be useful for somebody who wants to sport fly with a, a low-powered airplane and they just have it set to fly around right in a circle out on the field. And you can set the motor time for 10 minutes and then to DT right after that. Uh, so that's a parent feature. Something else that I feel is quite important is how the RDT or the Radio DT works with this brand of timer, with our brand of timer. Uh, as I've mentioned before, and I'll talk about later, when you push the button on the transmitter in your hand to DT the airplane, uh, if, the, if the motor is running, the motor, the motor stops instantaneously, and the DT occurs 1.3 seconds later. Other brands of timers require you to make a second push of the button to DT, and that's a, an invitation to a disaster. Let's say your airplane is, is gone hog wild, in power and you kill the motor but it's still heading straight for the ground and you still have to push that button again to DT it and bring that plane safely down. With my timer the DT occurs automatically 1.3 seconds after the engine quits if you're using RDT. I feel this is a very useful and a very valuable feature. Now the next, next item we're going to talk about is the ESC. Uh, commonly that's the abbreviation for engine speed controller. Now, uh, this is a radio control component. And for radio control, uh, this is the part that takes the signal from the radio control receiver and converts it to 
pulses to, to control the speed of the motor. However, for free flight, we have two speeds on the motor, off and on. <laughs> and, and that's fine, because that's, that's the nature of the beast that we're flying. Uh, these ESCs come, there's, there's many different manufacturers. They're most all produced in, this, in the country of China. They all come with no connectors for the, for the three wires that go to the motor. By the way, as you saw on the motor when we talked about it, and here's the speaker controller, these are the three wires that go to the motor that comes with no connectors. So I've already got connectors on here. These are, once again, the other half of the mating, mating uh, pins for the two millimeter uh, bullet connectors. Also, that comes with no connector for the battery. The speed controller connects straight to the battery. It comes with no, just bare wires, and that's and, and you have to put something on here. Well, of course, I have put the, the matching two pins Dean's connector. The final connector that's on the speed controller is goes to the timer. And once again, here's black, red, and white. And as you match that up with the markings on the timer, uh, and that's all you have to do. And on my timers, this ESC is on the top, and the servo motor, which we'll talk about next, is on the bottom. Now, uh, speed controllers are rated in amps. That has to do with how many amps of power it's capable of, of handling for the battery without doing damage to itself. Uh, most of these speed controllers are rated conservatively and so this particular one is rated at 12 amps. Uh, I have personally used it on motors uh, with 18 amps but now keep in mind uh, that we are running the motors for very short periods of time. Uh, 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And its heat is the enemy of these devices. And with running the motors for such a short period of time, it doesn't allow them to get overheated. Particularly if it's a, if it's, if it's a brand that is manufactured conservatively with conservatively rated components. Uh, this happens to be the brand of, of ESC that I sell, and I've just had excellent luck with it. Uh, yes, it's made in China. But uh, for all the years that I've been doing this, I've, I've used, I tested a lot of ESCs, and this is the one that I found was best. It was the best buy, both for price and performance. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't say that there aren't plenty of other good ESCs. But still, do keep in mind, when, if you're going to buy an ESC, it's going to come with no connectors for the motor and no connector for the battery. And that's going to be your responsibility or somebody else's if you can convince one of your friends to do it for you. Now, ESCs are all sold on the basis of amps. You know, there'll be a rating of 6 amps, 10 amps, 12 amps, 18 amps, 30 amps. Uh, and that's, that's just as an indication of how much power this ESC can handle on a continuous basis. Uh, there's a, something important to remember, however, is in free flight, we're not, the, we're not flying radio control, where the airplane is flying around up there for minutes and minutes and hours. Uh, we're flying only for a few seconds. And so the, the ampere rating is extremely conservative on most ESCs, then you can actually wind up pushing them to a higher, uh, higher current level than the rating is. Uh, I personally have used the, this 12 amp ESC uh, on 18 amp uh, motor draws uh, with no problems whatsoever. Uh, the other thing to know about is a term called watts because sometimes your motor when you look at the specifications for the motors, uh, they're going to have watts on there. You know, 50 watts, 80 watts, 100 watts, and that's how much power that motor can handle. Well, how do you convert watts when you know volts and amps? Well, that's very simple. Watts equals voltage times current or amperes. Uh, and uh, typically, let's say that you, the uh, your battery normally, uh, the 8.4 volt battery under load will probably be running about 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 8 volts. The 8.4 battery will be running about 8 volts uh, under use. So the battery is putting out 8 volts and let's say we're drawing, oh let's say it's easy, it's only 10 amperes. 
So the watts that's, that's being delivered to the motor is 8 times 10 or 80 watts, which is a reasonable power for E36. Uh, something else that, the, that this ESC does, which is really very important for us, is it takes care of doing an automatic shutdown if your battery voltage drops too low. Because we know, from, we know about the lithium polymer batteries that if we over discharge them, we ruin them. So this, this ESC is continuously monitoring the battery voltage. And if it drops below some preset value, it will shut the motor off automatically. Uh, and uh, very useful feature. Now, uh, as I mentioned, these things are set. Uh, the settings in here come preset from the factories already ready to go for radio control. Since we have some different needs in free flight, uh, it's very advantageous to be able to go in and change the presets inside the ESC. Uh, it's difficult for you to do it because it requires an RC transmitter, an RC receiver, uh, and, and following a very convoluted set of instructions on how to change the settings. Uh, there are programming cards that are available for some ESCs uh, that allow you to just plug that card into the, into the connector here on the ESC and make the changes in the settings uh, by yourself. Uh, by that I mean you might want to set the brake. Uh, what's the brake? Well the brake is something that when when we tell the motor to stop Normally, in radio control, that motor is going to continue to just kind of wind down and wind down slowly. Well, we don't want that in free flight. We want that, that motor to stop instantaneously. So there's a feature called the brake. And if that is activated on the ESC, it brings the propeller to a very quick stop, which, of course, is extremely useful uh, in uh, using when you're using a folder propeller. Uh, so uh, if you buy your ESC from me, I will preset the settings for free flight uh, for you so you don't have to worry about it. Now, can you use it as you get it from, the, from a hobby store? Yeah, certainly. Uh, it just may not be the optimum uh, for, for what you need in free flight. Another device that's very useful for us to have uh, when flying free flight, and that is a way to measure the actual power on an instantaneous basis in real time. And this is called a watt meter. It's not very expensive, typically around $20. Uh, and it plugs in, one side goes to your battery, the other side goes to your ESC. And when the motor is running, this display here will show you the volts that you have from your, on your battery. It'll show you how much current is flowing instantaneously and it will also pre-calculate and tell you how many watts of power you're, you're delivering. Uh, now, you'll notice these connectors here are not the connectors that you've been seeing before for the Deans. Uh, this has been set up for a much larger airplane with higher current draws. However, I have adapters that I can plug into both sides to use to, to mate up with the Deans connectors for E36. Once again, it's a watt meter, not very expensive, but it has a lot of information that you can find very useful when you're experimenting with different propellers. You want to see what, what difference the, the watts are, the, how much power the motor is drawing uh, on different, different propellers. Uh, it's a very invaluable tool and about the only way you can do it is with one of these devices. All right, let's talk about the final, final component. All right, this is the servo motor. Uh, it's probably, probably the least uh, the least complicated of all the items that we have to deal with because for our purposes the servo motor is either at rest or is rotated 90 degrees which, which is the maximum rotation 90, is rotated 90 degrees uh, to release the DT line and this is the connector that goes to the timer so that it takes the signal from the timer to rotate the servo. Now uh, the servo motors however come in a multitude of styles and varieties this is called a sub-micro servo. Uh, it's quite small. Typically, you can look at it from the side here. It's, it's quite small. It's very lightweight. Uh, this is about 3.7 grams of total weight. Uh, and in our uses, if you design your airplane properly, your DT release line properly, the servo has almost no load on it. And, and that's important because these servos, particularly in the sub-micro category, have very teeny tiny gears inside, very small teeth. And you do not want to have a large load pulling 
or stressing those gears uh, against the electronics which is trying to hold it to a given position. Uh, and that's why when, when we when later on when I show you a finished airplane I'm going to show you a slotted wheel that I use on my servos uh, and that takes almost all the load off of the servo motor and also makes it a very very easy to reload the, the DT line uh, for the next flight and I'll show that to you later on. So that pretty much completes a rundown of all the parts we talked about. Uh, well, let me just, just back up one minute and add this. Uh, this is a different style of motor and I mentioned that most motors have a three millimeter shaft on them which is fine. This however does not. This is a five millimeter shaft and it makes, it makes uh, connecting your things uh, a, a little bit uh, different. However, this hub, which is a hub that I sell, uh, and it's very, very, it's the most popular hub out there for folders, uh, has plenty of additional uh, aluminum here, and I actually drilled the hole out in the center from a three millimeter diameter hole to a five millimeter diameter to fit right over the shaft of this motor. And it works beautifully, no problem. I still have the same two grub screws on each side which I use to anchor to the to the motor shaft and then finally the motor comes with this nice little nut that you can thread on down there and tighten up again. Once again you tighten that up against the motor case since the motor case turns with, 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 with the propeller that works out just wonderfully. And so that's some people say well what am I going to do? Woe is me. I've got a larger shaft than three millimeters. Well get out your drill and drill it out because you got a lot of aluminum there to spare. Alright, thank you. Now the next step, next phase we're going to talk about is actually connecting uh, all, the, all the items together and we'll talk some more about connectors. Okay, so that's going to be in the next video.